Genakoto Katoa. Today's reading comes from Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here am I, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain, I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey, or I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on top of the altar, on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here am I, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Last week we looked at El Olam the eternal God. We talked about how our life here on earth is brief and fragile, and as followers of Christ, it should not be our primary focus. We are created to live for eternity, and as we encounter this eternal God, true Christ, God puts eternity in our hearts, and we now live with eternity in our minds, not on this perishable life. Whilst there are things on earth we need to do and responsibilities we have, our focus is not on, on storing up treasures on earth, but to focus on storing up treasures in heaven. So how then should we live our life here on earth? I want to introduce you to another name of God, a more well-known name found in some worship songs, Jehovah Jireh. What does that name really mean? And how does that name affect how we live our lives here on earth? The name Jehovah Jireh is found in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 14. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh. And to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Jehovah Jireh is the Anglicized version of the Hebrew name Yahweh Yireh. The name Yahweh was given to Moses when he asked God what his name was. He said, I am. Who I am. This name means the eternal self existent one. Whenever you see the word Lord in capital letters in your Bible, it's referring to Yahweh. Yireh, or the Anglicized version Jireh, means to see or to foresee. In the Old Testament, when you read about a seer or a fortune teller, the word Yireh is used. For example, in 1 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 9, we read, Formerly in Israel, if someone went to inquire of God, they would say, Come, let us go to the seer, Yireh, because the prophet of today used to be called a seer, 
Yireh. So you notice whenever the word seer is used uh, in the Old Testament, it is actually the word yire or the anglicized word jire. So you might ask then, why does the Bible translate the word jire into provide rather than using the word see or to foresee? I was curious as I thought about it, about the word provision. And I did a study of that word to see if it had anything to do with sight, you know, vision, provision, and sight. Uh, and I was right. And, and many of you may already know this, that the word provide comes from the Latin word providere, meaning forward seeing. Per meaning forward and videre meaning to see. So for example, you get the word video. It is something we see. So providere means to see beforehand. It's about making sure that what is needed will be there at the appropriate time. So say, for example, a parish is organizing a barbecue and I say, I will see to the drinks. What I'm saying is I'm going to make sure that the drinks are provided for at the appropriate time. So Yahweh Ire literally means the God who sees or the God who has foresight. The one who makes sure what is needed will be there at the appropriate time, not earlier, not later. And, and from now on, I'll, I'll use the anglicized version, Jehovah Jireh, rather than Yahweh Ire, just to make it easier to follow. What does it mean to know God as Jehovah Jireh? Looking at the life of Abraham, we can learn what it means to know Jehovah Jireh. And as we look at um, Abraham's life, we, we find that there, was, there are three steps to a life of faith. Step one, response. Step two, trust. And step three, sacrifice. It is interesting to see the similarities found in both Genesis 12 and Genesis 22 when we look at the life of faith of Abraham, which can help us understand what this life of faith is all about. I will touch briefly on first the first two steps, but we'll spend a bit of time explaining the third step and unpacking the beauty of the name Jehovah Jireh or Yahweh Yireh. So let's start at step one. Notice in both Genesis 12 and Genesis 22, the word that Abraham was called to respond to was the word go. Abraham was asked to go in Genesis 22 in the passage we're looking at today and also in Genesis chapter 12. Abraham, go. Leave the comfortable. Leave the known. Notice in both verses, God needed a response from Abraham. Now, Abraham could have chosen not to respond to God's invitation. Very similar to the invitation Jesus gave to his disciples when he said, come follow me. The disciples had a choice. They could leave everything to follow him, which they did, or else they could have just kept on fishing or tax collecting or being a zealot. Abraham, as well as Jesus' disciples, needed to make a response to the invitation, to the call. But before they can do that, they needed to count the cost. Can they follow through with this invitation? If they said yes, will they be prepared and willing to live this life of faith, to go on this journey of faith? Or should they say no and said, I will not take up this invitation, I'm going to stay at home? Or maybe do what many of us do, give lip service to this invitation to a life of faith and say yes, but still remain as we always have remained. Abraham could have gone to a service and, and sing wonderful songs of life of faith or pray wonderful prayers of life of faith. Abraham could sit there and hear wonderful sermons of life of faith uh, and say what a wonderful thing this life of faith is all about and still continue to remain in earth and do what he's always been doing. The disciples easily have done the same thing as well. But notice, a life of faith requires a response. We either say yes to this life of faith that we are called to live, or we say no. We can't stay in the middle. We can't sit on the fence on this. It's a yes or no answer. But notice also that the response to this life of faith does not only happen once and it's all over. I responded to the call of Christ 20 years ago or 5 years ago or last year or 10 years ago and I'm now a Christian and I don't need to make any more responses to God. Wrong. <laughs> you do. 
As you can see in Abraham's life, the need to make a response happened a number of times in Genesis 12, in Genesis 15, and here in Genesis 22. Here is an important spiritual truth. If Jesus said it, he would have said, truly, truly, I say to you, or verily, verily, I say to you. So listen carefully. The life of faith is a continuous journey of heeding God's call or invitation. We will go through step one multiple times in our life where we need to make a response. And each response we make, or should I say a positive response we make, draws us deeper into a relationship we have with God. Responding to the call not only makes us a Christian, it also grows us as a Christian. Why are we stagnant in our Christian life? Why are we not growing in our faith? It's because we are not constantly responding to God's call for us to press in deeper, to trust Him more. So every response we make draws us closer into step two, trust. So let's go to that second step. Notice in both verses, Abraham was called to allow God to show him where he should go. In Genesis 22, God would show him to the mountain he was to go. And in Genesis 12, it was go to the land God would show him. Abraham was not only called to respond to God's invitation, he was also called to trust God to lead him. If you were in Abraham's shoes, what would you have done? Would you be able to step out and trust God by faith and not by sight? Paul explains in the Christian life in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 when he said, We walk by faith, not by sight. Looking back in my own life, if I had walked by sight, not by faith, I would not have done as much kingdom work as I would have done in the last 40 plus years from the moment I accepted Christ and responded to his invitation to come follow him. Multiple times he asked me to respond to a call even though I had no idea what the call would lead me into. There were times I had to make a response even though I did not have the resources to make the response. It was a step of faith. And yet having stepped out, I've seen God teach or show me amazing things about a life of faith which I would not have experienced if I didn't trust him to lead me. Look, to what, look at what the writer to the Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 to 10. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. You see, Abraham had no idea where God would lead him to, but he trusted God and set out on a journey with God. And even when he got to the place God had planned for him, he chose not to build his foundations on that place, that temporal place, this earthly place. He lived as a stranger in tents. He did not build his life's foundations on this place because it was earthly. He kept his eyes on the, the city of God, the eternal city of God, whose foundation was built by God, the architect and builder. Way back in Genesis, we see someone who lived with eternity in their hearts. He was looking forward to this eternal city whose architect and builder is God. What gives meaning to this brief, fragile, mortal life is that life's foundation is not found in this world, but in the eternal city of God. Without having eternity in mind as our foundation, we would look at the futility of mortal life that we talked about last week. If our foundation is on the things of this world, you will find yourself being let down time and time and time again. It will lead us to being anxious or worried about the circumstances of life. There are many people during this time of COVID-19 who are living in fear of whether they would have a job or whether their business would survive. Now, now these are all normal human emotions and it becomes a concern because we need money to live. And there is nothing wrong having these concerns and talking it over with God in prayer. 
But for many people, their whole lives are built around temporal foundations. And when that is taken away, they crash. I know people personally who have committed suicide because their temporal foundation has been taken away. Their business had collapsed. They were close to bankruptcy. They lost a child. They couldn't cope with life any longer because their whole focus of life was built on this weak and temporal foundations. And when that foundation is taken away, their shaky, fragile life collapses. Moses lived with eternity in his heart and he rested in the foundation of the eternal city and he lived as a pilgrim even in the land that God gave him because he saw it as temporal. When Abraham heard the call, he went because he sought the city with foundation whose architect and builder is God. One who hears the call of God realizes deeply that his only foundation is God. And without it, he is only, not only lost in this fragile temporal life, but for all eternity. It is that knowledge that causes us to respond to God, the architect and builder of life for all eternity. Many times I've been asked this question, if I become a Christian, do I have to give this up or that up? Do I have to stop doing this or stop doing that? One who asks this question is not coming to God at all. They're not coming to God as God. They're not willing to follow step one and step two. We have conditions to our response. God, I will follow you as long as I don't have to change my lifestyle or to go to the mission field or give up my sinful behavior that I enjoy. I'm happy to be a Christian as long as God does not cause me to change. It doesn't work that way. Who is the Lord of your life? You or God? If it's you, then go and live whatever you want. But if it's God, then you need to respond appropriately and not make demands on what God can and cannot do in your life. If we are to respond and trust God to lead us, then God has to be the absolutely sacred, non-negotiable thing in your life. There can be no other idols. And that leads us to step three. Notice in step three, there is a call for sacrifice. In Genesis 22, the sacrifice is Abraham's only son, Isaac. This was because Isaac was the son of promise, the one promised to come to Abraham and Sarah, not from Hagar, the servant of Sarah, who gave birth to Ishmael. In Genesis 12, the sacrifice is Abraham's safety, familiarity, status, culture, and family. Notice step three is closely linked to step two. In trusting God, Abraham was making eternity his foundation. But for that to become a reality, God required him to make a sacrifice of all that was potential foundations in his life. His home, his safety, his status and position, his business, his family, and now his only son whom he loved dearly. He was the child of promise from God and and that was becoming his foundation. You know, God's blessings or ministry or promises can become a foundation we build our life on. And when we don't see any blessings from God, or if our ministry goes wrong, we are affected because we have placed the wrong things as the foundation and not God himself, who is the eternal God. I want to talk a little bit about God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son. This has been a stumbling block for many people. How could God ever ask someone to sacrifice a son? What kind of God is that? If God is so cruel to ask a parent to give up a child, then I cannot follow that God. Or we just ignore that passage and say, well, I don't quite understand the Old Testament God, so I will just believe in the New Testament God as if the New Testament God is different from the Old Testament God. Or that God has just decided to turn over a new leaf in the New Testament. I want to suggest to you that the Old Testament God is the same as the New Testament God. They're both the same God. The God who is dealing with Abraham in Genesis 22 is the same God who told Abraham in Genesis 17 that he is El Shaddai, the all-sustaining one, who gave his name Yahweh, meaning the self-existent one to Moses at the burning bush 
who gave the Ten Commandments and the law in Exodus and told Moses that he is Elkanah, the jealous God, who is jealously guarding his relationship with his people, who Moses knew as El Olam, as the eternal God, who from infinity to infinity is the same and does not change. And the same God we find in Jesus in the New Testament. They are all the same God. So knowing that God does not change and that the God who in the Ten Commandments said, you shall not kill, and in Leviticus 18 says, not to offer any child's sacrifice as it profanes the name of God, would not and could not force Abraham to do something that goes against the sacredness of God. This means the testing of Abraham was not about murdering Isaac or about offering him as a child's sacrifice. God does not force people to do anything that goes against His holiness, goes against anything that He sees as sacred. If this is so, why did God ask Abraham to offer Isaac as a sacrifice? Well, during Abraham's time, the focus was on family, not on individuals. So every decision would benefit the far now or the extended family not the individual. Very different from today's world where everything centers around the individual. Back in Abraham's time and in most ancient cultures, it was all about the family. And it was often uh, a practice that the oldest son got almost all the inheritance and he became the benefactor of everyone else in the extended family. He looks after not only his own immediate family, but the families of all his brothers and sisters. If the inheritance was divided up equally, the family would lose the, the, their status in the community. So to keep their position in society, the wealth was not divided up or broken up amongst the different siblings, but was given to the eldest son who would then look after the whole far now, the whole extended family. So when God comes along and says, the firstborn is mine, what he's saying is that the most important person in your life and in the life of your family belongs to me. But not only the firstborn human, God also wants the firstborn of every animal, the first fruit of every grain. They all belong to God. What God is saying is, whatever you see as precious, you need to see it as a sacrifice to me. They belong to me. We often give God whatever is left. If I have enough money, by the time I take care of all my expenses, I will give him a small portion. We often give God from whatever is left. But God demanded from Abraham and, and from his word that we give him what we count as valuable. King David sort of understood this principle in giving God what costs us something. In 2 Kings Chapter 24, God told King David to build an altar on the threshing floor of this person to stop a plague that was spreading amongst the people. So when King David went to that person and asked if he could buy the threshing floor so that he can build an altar for, for God, this person, Arauna the Jebusite, said he would give the threshing floor to the king, including the oxen and the sledges and yoke for wood, so that King David could offer the sacrifice. Now, if we were giving, given something free to help in the worship of God, like if someone were to come and offer to pay for the roof at St. Timothy's, we would say, thank you, God. That's an amazing gift, a real answer to prayer. But what was King David's response? No, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. David knew this very important spiritual principle. I will not offer a sacrifice, any offering to God, if it did not cost me anything. David knew that God deserves the best that we have, not the leftovers. Something to think about when we make our offerings to God. So God here is saying to Abraham, I deserve what is the most important thing in your life. That belongs to me. Now, I, I need to say that many times in choosing people, God did not go for the firstborn. He chose the younger. But that's another sermon that I will give at another time. 
So when God comes to Abraham and asks for Isaac, God is saying to Abraham, I want you to give up all rights you have to your only son Isaac. He belongs to me. God was not wanting Abraham to commit murder or to offer child sacrifice. That was the furthest thing in God's mind. It went against everything God stood for. But what God was saying is, I want you, Abraham, to know that what is the most valuable thing to you, I want you to offer that to me. From God's perspective, God was testing to see if Abraham would trust him enough to give his only son, the heir to everything he owned, this child of promise who would make him the father of a multitude. From Abraham's perspective, it would mean giving up everything he dreamed about, everything he hoped for, everything he lived for. And Abraham was willing to give up the promises he had embraced for so long to give back to God his very best. So when you read Hebrews chapter 11, verses 18 and 19, the writer to the Hebrews says this, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God said to him, It is true, Isaac, that your offspring will be reckoned. We come now to the beauty of Jehovah Jireh. Can you imagine what was going on in Abraham's head as he journeyed with his son over the three days? I believe that that journey, whilst it must have been very hard for Abraham, would have also been a journey of faith. It was not so much Abraham thinking, I can do it, I must do it, I will do it, I have to obey. He was not driven by obedience. He was driven by faith. God will do it. God will provide. God will see to it. When you notice the dialogue that Abraham had with his son, the son said, we have the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb? And what was Abraham's response? God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. God will provide the lamb. God will see to the lamb. We don't need to worry about it. In Abraham's mind, as he continued on his journey, God was going to provide the lamb. God is the one who will do it. Abraham was saying, by faith, I'm walking to this place. God has asked me to go to offer up my son as a sacrifice to him since he's my firstborn and he belongs to God. But God will see to it that there will be a lamb for the burnt offering. If God's word stands true, that true Isaac and his descendants, all the nations will be blessed, then I'm going to hold on to this and I'm going to trust God that he will work all things out for good. This was what was getting Abraham up the mountain. His words was not, On that mountain of the Lord, it will be obeyed. But on that mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Genesis 22 and verse 14. He was not saying, on that mountain, I will do it. But on that mountain, God will do it. Abraham didn't know how God was going to do it. But he knew that God will see to it that his promise will be fulfilled. What an amazing faith. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 4 verses 18 to 22. Against all hope. Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, So shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and his and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. So what was credited to him as righteousness? His faith. This unshakable faith that trusted that what God had promised, he will bring it to pass. He knew without a shadow of doubt that God will see to the Lamb 
even if the lamb came at that very last minute. But you know what the real beauty of Jehovah Jireh is? This same mountain that God led Abraham up to offer a burnt offering was the same mountain that Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared to his father David. It became the temple where sacrifices were offered year after year. A few hundred years later, the father led his only son up that same mountain where he let the son be put up on the wood again. God once again saw to it that a lamb was made available. This time, the lamb was the lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. That same mountain that God led Abraham to was the same mountain where Solomon's temple was built and the sacrifices were offered annually was the same mountain where the lamb of God gave his life to the whole world. Paul applies the word of Genesis 22 to Jesus when he said, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Hebrews 10 verse 11 to 14 says this, Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But when this priest had offered for, for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Because of Abraham's faith that God will see to it that a lamb will be sacrificed so that all the nations of the world will be blessed. On that very spot, where Abraham was willing to sacrifice his only son, whom he loved dearly. That very spot where he built an altar to Jehovah Jireh, the God who will see to it that the lamb is sacrificed, was the very spot that God saw to it that the lamb was sacrificed. The lamb being his one and only son, whom he loved dearly, so that the whole world would be blessed. So what is the beauty of Jehovah Jireh. Paul writes in Romans 8 verse 31 to 39 and we're coming to an end. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Let's just pause for a moment here. Did you hear that? God is now Jehovah Jireh because he who gave his one and only son whom he loved dearly to redeem us, would he not also graciously give us not some things or a few things, but all things? He who redeemed us will be the God who sees that we get all the things we need to live this life of faith. Let's continue reading this Romans 8. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, anything this world can throw at us, anything that makes this mortal life fragile and brief, Anything that can be thrown at us, can anything separate us from the love of Christ, the eternal God that we place our trust in? As it is written, for, for, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. And he goes on, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor excuse me, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of this eternal God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, experience today this Jehovah Jireh by seeking God's kingdom and his righteousness and trusting him to take care of everything. Jesus in the Sermon of the Mount tells his disciples to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness and everything else will fall into place. When we build our lives on a foundation that lasts for all eternity, 
Jehovah Jireh says, I will see to it that everything else will fall into place. I, Jehovah Jireh, will see to it that you will lack nothing because I will see to it. You can trust me. Now, this doesn't mean that we just sit at home and twiddle our thumbs expecting God to provide for you. God doesn't bless laziness. Neither should you say, I trust God so I don't need to see a doctor or take any medicine or get insurance because God will take care of my needs. God doesn't bless foolishness. Besides, by doing that, you're just saying to God, I want you to only act in a certain way. Rather, God is wanting you to trust Him. Get on with life and the responsibilities you have in this life, but don't build your life on weak earthly foundations. Build it on the foundations of, of the eternal city where God is both architect and builder. And if you have been listening to this message and it makes sense to you why Christ had to die for you, then can I invite you to come to Christ and follow the steps of faith that, you, that God is calling you to walk. Respond to his invitation to follow him. Seek his forgiveness for living a life that went against God's ways and start trusting him to lead you and sacrifice your old way of living to follow the way God wants you to live. Heavenly Father, you are our Jehovah Jireh, the one who sees to it that all our needs are looked after as we trust you. Lord, if we have never ever placed our faith in you, help us today to trust you, to come to you, to ask you to forgive us of our sins and to turn to you and follow you all the days of our life. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come and stir in our hearts and help us to know and experience Jehovah Jireh and be willing to put your kingdom and your righteousness first, to build our foundation on, on you and to trust you to take care of everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.